This is Democracy Watch. So, Mark, let's discuss the Supreme Court's decision to review the immunity case. Now, first of all, what could the rationale possibly be to schedule arguments for April 22nd? This is two full months from now because the Supreme Court's already shown us that they can act quickly. They did it in Bush v. Gore. Uh, they did it in the 2020 election while refusing to hear the Texas lawsuit that sought to invalidate the election results in four other states. So given the time sensitive nature here, what's the justification? There can be no justification. There is no justification. I, you know, I was reading Twitter and some of the early social media posts about this. And, and honestly, I was disgusted by the people who are trying to say, oh, look, look how quick they're moving. Look how quick they're moving. Look, here's the deal. The president of the United States is not above the law. Okay, Donald Trump is does not deserve a different set of rules than everybody else. And we have talked about this before. Our court system is failing because he is gaming this system and the courts are letting him get away with it. The fact is the Court of Appeals took too long to write their opinion, but they wrote it and it was a perfectly accept acceptable position. The world does not need to hear from nine justices on this, okay? The three judges on the D.C. Circuit who wrote a coherent, cogent opinion, you know, said enough. And if the Supreme Court did want to write an opinion on this, as you say, they, you know, we're at their pleasure, right? These, these folks don't hear thousands of cases a year. They don't hear hundreds of cases a year. They don't even hear 100 cases a year. They could schedule oral argument on three days' notice, and issue an opinion five days later if they wanted to. Like I said, the lawyers, we're all here at their pleasure. But the fact is, people need to stop looking for a justification here or a good explanation for it. The fact is that the courts are failing us when it comes to holding Donald Trump accountable. Not just the Supreme Court in this case, by the way. I've been critical of the gag order allowances. He runs around trashing judges, runs around trashing prosecutors. You know, this whole buy-in that I hear people accepted that somehow you can't have a trial when it's too close to the election. I mean, forget it. There's no excuse for this, and it's wrong. You know, I, I know a lot of people out there feel like this is the conservative court giving the game away, showing how in the tank they are for the Republican Party. What's your reaction to that sentiment? You know, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, where where are the dissents uh, from that scheduling order? You know, where are the where are the where are the three liberals uh, saying, hey, I dissent. I would have denied cert. Right. We've seen that. We've seen situations in which we sure as hell see it when when you know, when I when when I or other pro-democracy lawyers, when stuff, we oftentimes see conservative uh, justices write separately, which, by the way, part of the process There's nothing wrong with that. But I don't know whether this is a there's two possibilities here, Brian. One is it is, as you say, this is a conservative liberal divide, that the conservatives are going out of their way to help Donald Trump. The other, which is what I'm ringing the alarm bells for, is something actually much more serious, which is that the judicial system as a whole, not right-wing judges, not conservative, you know, just the judicial system as a whole is being gamed by this guy, and it is unable and unwilling to stand up for itself. I don't believe that the D.C. Circuit panel was conservative. Certainly, judge, uh, the trial judge in D.C. is not a conservative. But I have to say, I think that they have given way too much leeway to Donald Trump's nonsense. I think some of the judges in New York, even the ones where we wound up, you know, uh, with, uh, you know, liability, I think that there has been they have not treated Donald Trump they would tr the way they would treat a 25-year-old black man who got arrested on a drug charge and who pulled these stunts. And I just think that it says a lot about the failures of our court system, irrespective of whether they are conservative or liberal. But maybe you're right. Maybe it is just at the Supreme Court level, it's a more conservative thing. I fear that it's actually more just them willing to be gamed by a former president. Mark, on the mechanics of this thing, how does the Supreme Court make a decision like this? Like, do all of the justices have to agree on the timing here on this on this two month delay? Is it is it just the majority that decides? Yeah. So there were two decisions made here, and it's important to parse those apart. The first was, are they going to hear the case? That takes four justices. All nine justices get the get the papers. All nine justices weigh in. Um, there is what's referred to as the rule of four, which is that you need four justices to grant cert. Okay, to grant review. So it took four justices to agree to hear the case. But the second decision here, which we haven't touched on, but is really important is, is the stay in place in the meantime? 
because they could have said, we're going to hear this case. But by the way, in the meantime, the trial goes forward. You know, in the meantime, you all get ready. Keep going. You know, your trial won't be before the end of the, the end of the term. And if we have to put a halt on it, we'll put on a halt on it then, you know, before the trial gets going. But in the meantime, everyone get ready, keep going. And they didn't do that. They left the stay in place. And that took five votes. So I, I am critical of the fact that they heard the case, because as I said, the Court of Appeals decision was perfectly acceptable. And the U.S. Supreme Court doesn't hear a lot of cases. They could have not heard this one. But I'm super critical, which is where I get into this question of like, is it a conservative thing or is it just the judiciary is ill-equipped to handle the reality that of the existential threat of democracy? Is why did they lift this? Why did they keep the stay? Why didn't they let the parties get ready for trial? Because the trial wouldn't be wouldn't have been before July anyway, and the Supreme Court term ends at the end of June. So we would have had an answer from the Supreme Court if they needed to stop this, if in some weird world Donald Trump were to win, which he's not going to, uh, they could have stopped the trial. But instead, they kept the pause in place. And what that does is it means nothing in the trial can go forward in the meantime. And to that exact point, what's the what's the disadvantage of just allowing this trial to move forward while they decided whether or not you know, whether or not a president with this absurd notion that a president has carte blanche to commit crimes with impunity? Why not just let this trial continue to play out? Absolutely. There's absolutely no reason. And, you know, the argument that, you know, the Trump folks made as well, you know, it harms him to have to prepare for trial. I mean, come on. I mean, come on. Give me a break. You know, this guy's getting every break in the book anyway, every benefit of the doubt in the judicial system. There is no constitutional right not to prepare for trial. <laughs> you know, there's no, I'm, yeah. I'm not sure there's a constitutional right for him to not even have to go through a trial, uh, you know, while the case is before the Supreme Court. You know, remember in Georgia, um, some of the, uh, the, the defendants, including Mark Meadows, said, look, we have a right not to have to go through the trial. Uh, while uh, their own sort of separate claim of immunity was decided. And everyone agreed, no, 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 no. Like, look, you go through, you have to go through the state trial. And if it turns out that was wrong, then it can get overturned afterwards. But right. but we're not even imposing that. We're not even suggesting to impose that on Donald Trump. We're saying, go ahead and file your pretrial motions. You know, you can start the process of, you know, getting exhibits and all of that. And in the meantime, the Supreme Court can consider this what is a preposterous legal theory, which they're going to reject. So um, there was no good reason to do this. And as I said, you know, there's no one else. There's no other criminal defendant who gets treated this way. Mark, what do you believe is the likelihood of any cases besides Manhattan, which is starting on March 25th, besides that one happening before the election are? Um, increasingly small. You know, I think the New York case will go, as you say, the, the, you know, that case is on is on track and I expect that case will go um, on time. Maybe it'll be delayed by a week. You never, you know, you can always have something with a jury selection takes longer than you think. But that case is going to go on time. You know, the case in Florida, which honestly is a slam dunk. I mean, you know, I went back the other day and reread the indictment. Like, we are all forgetting. Donald Trump took classified documents. Then when he was asked to return them, he said no. Then when he was asked if he still had any more, he said no. He lied. He told them that he had returned everything. And, and, and it is a crime both to lie, but it's also a crime to merely possess the documents. Like this is where like I feel like we have gone in again, like we've we've forgotten what 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 is was so self-evident, which is it is a crime to possess the documents he possessed. Period. It is a slam dunk case, but that case is now bogged down in Lord knows what claims claims that he and his lawyers are making. But that case doesn't look like it's going before the election. Um, and then the Georgia case, that case doesn't seem to be right now on a fast track. You know, here is my request, and I'm going to look straight in the camera and ask everyone who's watching this uh, to, to amplify and, and, and sort of insist on this. If this, the Supreme Court decides this case on the last day of its term in June, this trial in D.C. needs to go immediately. You know, we say it is less likely, but here's the deal. There is no reason Donald Trump can't be stand trial in September. There is no reason Donald Trump can't stand trial in October. There is no reason Donald Trump can't be in the midst of trial on election day. There is no constitutional right to avoid trial because you are running for office. And I worry 
that people have bought into this idea that there is a point at which it is too late to be fair to Donald Trump. There is no point at which it is too late for Donald Trump to stand trial. So I'd ask all of you to amplify that. Don't let the norm, the normalcy of this idea that after some date in late August or September, it's just too late. It is never too late for the criminal justice system to hold Donald Trump avail uh, accountable, and we all need to insist on that. Perfectly put, Mark. What's your message to people who feel like they've lost hope as a result of this? You know that the that the system is too rigged against us to ever even have a chance to succeed. Yeah. So look, I'm disappointed. I'm angry. Uh, you can tell I'm emotional about this. I've spent my entire life committed to the law. I've spent my entire life committed to telling clients and telling ordinary citizens and voters, don't give up on the courts. And I know in this moment, it is very easy to say, Mark, I'm giving up on the courts. This whole thing doesn't seem fair, but I am, but I, but you have to, you have to listen and believe Donald Trump wants you to give up on the courts. Donald Trump and his supporters want you to believe the system doesn't work because if we don't have a court system that functions the vote suppressors win, the election deniers win, the, aut the autocrats win. That's why every dictator wants to delegitimize the courts. So I'm very upset about this situation, but it, we need to double down in our resolve. Every day, each and every one of us needs to wake up every day and ask, what can we do to defend democracy? What is the thing we can do in our daily lives to ensure that the next generation of Americans have a stronger, more inclusive, more fair, more perfect country than the one that we had before. And in the dark moments when it feels like the, that that causes losing and Donald Trump may be winning and the courts are not protecting us, we need to dig deeper and not retreat, but we need to dig dip, deeper and move forward. And so don't lose hope, don't lose faith, keep fighting for democracy. Perfectly put. We'll leave it there. Uh, of course, for everybody watching right now, if you want to support the the invaluable work that Mark and his team are doing, especially, you know, which is especially important now in light of what we're seeing uh, so much of in the courts, the best way to do that is to sign up for Democracy Docket. It's the free news outlet Mark founded to focus on everything voting and elections. I'll put the link right here on the screen and also in the post description of this video. I'm Brian Tyler Cohen. I'm Mark Elias. This is Democracy Watch. Democracy Watch.